Inauguration morning. This is the DM, accompanied by Vice President-elect Barclay, enter Capital Platter World. He condemns communism as a false philosophy and calls for greater liberty around the world. Then, with Vice President Barclay... In a hectic week celebrating his becoming president in his own right, Mr. Truman, really enjoying himself, tells Truman Barkley Club members... I'm in a rather embarrassing position. Both my bosses are sitting here at this uh, table. <laughs> the only two people in the world that I ever call boss, I still call Barkley boss, and I've always had for the last, as long as I can remember. <laughs> Senator Barkley and I have been going along with the Democratic Party ever since we can remember. And he's somewhat younger than I am. Uh, but I'll say this, that as long as I was a member of the United States Senate, when my leader in the United States Senate decided on a policy that the Democratic Party should pursue I followed that leader in the pursuit of that policy, and I think that's a good plan. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm putting out a little propaganda. At the Electoral College dinner on the eve of his taking oath, Mr. Truman, for the first time, tells how he spent the night of America's most surprising election. I had my sandwich and glass of buttermilk and went to bed at 6.30. And along about 12 o'clock, I happened to wake up for some reason, and the radio was turned on on the National Broadcasting Company. And Mr. Kelton Bourne was saying, while well, the president is a million votes ahead in the popular vote, we have yet to hear from the president. <laughs> and we are very sure that when the country vote comes in, Mr. Truman will be defeated by an overwhelming majority. <laughs> and I went back to bed and went to sleep. <laughs> At about four o'clock in the morning, the chief of the Secret Service came in and said, Mr. President, I think you'd better get up and listen to the, the broadcast. <laughs> We've been listening all night. And I said, all right. And I turned the darn thing on, and <laughs> there was Mr. Kelton born again. <laughs> then Mr. Harkness came on and analyzed the situation. I called the Secret Service men, and I said, we'd better go back to Kansas City. It looks as if I'm elected. <laughs> Along about 10 o'clock, I got a telegram which said that the, the uh, election was over and that uh, I should be congratulated on the fact that I had won the election. And uh, apparently it was too bad, but it happened. <laughs> Later that night, at the National Guard Auditorium, the President and his family are honored at a giant inaugural gala. The Whistle Stop Express, a reminder of the President's grueling campaign tours, brings in some of the 700 Hollywood stars who present the Entertainment World Salute to the Trumans, one of the biggest shows in history. Presidents before him, here Woodrow Wilson, have stood and taken their oaths in exactly this position. A month after Wilson was inaugurated, America was forced into World War I. Here, Calvin Coolidge, in an era of fabulous prosperity, was sworn in to succeed himself. Here, in March 1929, at the peak of the prosperity, which seven months later came crashing down into the Depression, Herbert Hoover was inaugurated. Four years later, Franklin D. Roosevelt began the unprecedented four-term administration, which was to make him known and loved throughout the world. 
This was March 4th, 1933. Twelve years and one month later, on the eve of victory, Franklin Roosevelt died. Humble and heartbroken, Harry Truman, with tears in his eyes, repeated the presidential oath after Chief Justice Stone at a simple ceremony in the White House. The same Bible opened to Blessed Are the Peacemakers